Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to Deacon Edge for this, the second of the Archbishop's Breakfast Conversations in 2014. As we begin this morning, we acknowledge the original custodians of this land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and their elders past and present, and we pay our respects to any Indigenous people who are with us this morning. My name is Chris Lancaster and I'm Assistant Curate in the Anglican Parish of St Andrew in Brighton and I'm your MC this morning for this conversation on the topic, the demise of manufacturing in Australia. And joining us for, uh, to discuss this important and timely topic are Claire O'Neill MP and Professor Ian Harper. Claire O'Neill became a member of the Australian Labor Party at age 17 and in March 2003, while she was still studying at university, she ran for and was elected as a city councillor in the city of Greater Dandenong, aged 22. After one year in this position, she was elected the mayor of Greater Dandenong, becoming the youngest female mayor of a local government area in Australia's history. Claire holds a double degree in arts and law from Monash University, and she attended Harvard University as a Fulbright Scholar, where she graduated with a Master of Public Policy. She has worked in the private sector as a management consultant at McKinsey and Company, where she advised some of the largest and most influential companies around the world. And in 2013, she was elected to federal parliament as the member for Hotham. Her electorate in southeast Melbourne takes in parts of Murrumbina, Oakley, Clayton, Moorabbin, Springvale and Dingley, among other suburbs. And Claire is passionate about serving the Hotham community and contributing to the implementation of solid social policy. So Claire O'Neill, we welcome you. Thank you. Professor Ian Harper is one of Australia's best known economists. He's worked closely with governments, banks, corporates and leading professional services firms at the highest level. This year, Ian was appointed to chair the Abbott government's Competition Policy Review, a root and branch review of Australia's competition policy, laws and regulators. Ian is often asked to comment on economic and financial issues in the media and is sought after as a public speaker. In March 2011, Ian joined Deloitte Access Economics as a partner. He had previously served 16 years at the Melbourne Business School and was elected Emeritus Professor of the University of Melbourne on his departure. From De December 2005 to July 2009, Ian Harper served as inaugural chairman of the Australian Fair Pay Commission and from January, January 2011 to February 2012, he was one of three panellists chosen to review Victoria's state finances. Ian was elected a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia in 2000 and a Fellow of the Australian Institute of Company Directors in 2009. So Ian Harper, we welcome you. Thank you. So we look forward to all that is in store for us in this next hour and a quarter and I hand over to you, Archbishop Philip. Thank you, Chris. Well, I'm sure it comes uh, as no surprise to anyone here that, that the issue of manufacturing is topical and uh, probably Victoria is a place that couldn't be more topical. I mean, the numbers I have, which I'm taking from a report in the uh, Weekend Australian just on this past weekend, is that at the uh, beginning of 2008, there were over one million Australian manufacturing jobs and by the uh, second quarter of 2013, that are reduced to 938,000. So uh, a significant reduction uh, just in that period and then with the announcements of uh, manufacturing um, works, whole industries closing, uh, we can see that being accelerated. So uh, that's really the, the broad context and I think we might be able to diverge out on some other things about how, uh, how that affects people because we don't just want to have uh, fully an economic discussion, we want to understand the, the social impact of it and just uh, in talking to people as, as I was coming in here, I know there's many people here who've got personal experience of uh, their own lives being quite changed as a result of uh, these, these changes in our industry and in our economy. So look forward to hearing some of your, uh, your personal experiences as we come to that time of interaction at the end. But Ian, just uh, perhaps to, to op open up our thinking, mm. uh, tell us uh, 
what's the what's the broad economic theory and uh, practices at work here? <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Archbishop. Uh, I do welcome the opportunity to talk about the economics of it. In doing so, as you pointed out, I don't want to be heard as saying, even at the outset, that economics is all that this matter is about. But having said that, it's the economic pressures and transformation in particular of the Australian economy which is causing this. Uh, manufacturing has been on a slow decline as a share of the Australian economy for probably a century. Uh, and it's, I emphasise, a slow decline. So the industry itself has continued to grow, but it hasn't grown as fast as the rest of the economy. So as a share of the economy, manufacturing has gradually been shrinking and replaced by the services sector. Uh, Australia is often thought of as a great mining country and a rural country, and of course our, those industries are great industries. But frankly, the bulk of the Australian economy uh, is represented by the services industries, 80% of all jobs. 80% of all output is in the services sector. Um, at Access Economics, we've done some forecasts of what the Australian economy might look like in 30 years' time. And it might interest the audience, Archbishop, to know that those forecasts show that manufacturing in 2033, uh, in, sorry, 43, will still be a substantial share of the Australian economy. But it will continue to have shrunk as a share of the Australian economy over that time. Uh, the other thing, of course, that's happening to manufacturing is that it's changing its nature. So the manufacturing industry in 2043, even 2023, will look a whole lot different from manufacturing today. So two things are happening. The economy itself is changing its structure, and the nature of manufacturing is moving away from labour intensity, mm. increasingly towards capital intensity and design and other dimensions of manufacturing. Mm. Maybe I could just yeah, add please, to yeah. that, Archbishop. I think one of the important things to note about this is that it's a global phenomenon. So it's certainly not something that we're just seeing in Australia. Mm. When we look at other developed economies like the UK and the US, we've seen a similar change of a similar magnitude. Mm. Um, and, and there's a, one reason that all this is happening, one, one of the biggest drivers of all this, is actually technology. Uh, it's not because we're not good at manufacturing in Australia or anything like that. And, and we know that because even when we look at countries like China and Taiwan and South Korea, which we think of as the, these sort of chief uh, manufacturing powerhouses, even in those countries, the percent of the population that works in manufacturing is declining over time. Uh, and I see this a lot because um, I have a, a very lucky to have a lot of manufacturers in my electorate. And when I visit car components manufacturers today, there are literally robots who are putting together um, elements of the cars. And those robots are doing jobs that um, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, would have taken four or five employees. So it's simply um, one of the realities of the way that our economy is changing. But with a more skilled workforce, uh, does that give us more optimism that people can move between employment sectors because of those skill base that they've got? If, if robots are doing the manual welding and yeah. those kind of less skilled jobs? Well, <coughs> indeed, I mean, over, over the longer term, if you look at economic history, you see the same sort of transformation in some respects has been happening for a couple of hundred years at least. Uh, and what you see there is more jobs being created uh, generally speaking, of a higher value as we pass through the transition. Now, it still requires, as you say, Archbishop, people to move from one type of industry to another and for the skilling process to continue, which casts the light onto the education and skill formation system. That has to be up to facilitating this transformation. Otherwise, uh, you know, as the Luddites pointed out, <laughs> you get left behind. Mm. That's true. And being a Luddite is not particularly a pleasant place to be. Uh, how do we help people to adjust to the transformation? How do we take that part of the surplus which this transformation creates and reinvest that in the people? Well, that's a very important issue. Yeah, I think this is a really, really interesting question because when you, when you think about the economy and when you look at it from a very strictly economic point of view, there is this idea that we see jobs being... Um, in decline or being destroyed in certain parts of the economy, but there's jobs growth in different parts of the economy. So you think, well, we can just retrain people over here and put them into these jobs. Um, but what we're actually seeing, um, and the, the shutdown of automotive in Australia is a good example of this, is a, a general decline in the economy of low-skill jobs in favour of the creation of high-skill jobs. 
And we should be really pleased and really proud in Australia that we are seeing such strong growth in, in high school jobs, jobs where you might need a university degree to get employed. Um, but that's where this question about social consequences really comes in. Um, so manufacturing, car manufacturing, and we're going to see the loss of at least 50,000 jobs of people who are directly employed in cars or um, components manufacturers. Um, those are not very high skill manufacturing jobs by and large. There are some high skill manufacturing jobs within that 50,000. Um, but about almost half of people in, who work in manufacturing in Australia don't have a qualification beyond high school. So the reality is that those people are probably not going to retrain, particularly late in their career, into to these higher skill jobs. So w what we have here is, is a social issue. What are we going to do in Australia when um, 50,000 people um, lose their jobs in automotive manufacturing and potentially can't be retrained into these industries? Because I, I guess, you know, I don't want us to be in a way deterministic, because as far as I can see, one of the tasks of uh, politics and probably much of the rhetoric of politicians is to um, often want to stand against the, you know, the apparent tides of economic circumstance. And uh, we, we briefly had a window into this, I think, uh, in the last week when uh, there was a question about the diesel fuel rebate, which I understand is worth something like about $1.8 billion uh, uh, to the mining industry, but that was quickly said, no, no, that's not going to be affected. But, you know, that, they're the scales of, of um, uh, tilts of making something more competitive, I guess we're talking about at national level, yet uh, politically it was decided that the $500 million investment in the car industry was not one to mm. uh, continue or promote. Um, I just really want to briefly just hold on to this question about the inevitability of change. Whilst these changes are, are happening, uh, is it any longer imaginable that we can do anything other than simply uh, accept the, the inevitable drive of these changes and, uh, and seek to ameliorate their destructive <laughs> consequences? It's oh. a great question. Ma could I just make, make one ahead, point yeah. just before... I, I will answer that, but just before I get to that, I don't think this, should, this shouldn't be a, a doom and gloom discussion. Um, one of the things I really hope that people who have come here this morning take away from this is that manufacturing in Australia is not dying. It's certainly not dead and it's not dying. I had a forum last night in my electorate with about 50 local manufacturers. Um, there's a, a man there who runs a nanotechnology company. Um, they've invented a new way to build hearing aids, almost 100% export focused. Um, and his uh, buyers tell him that they would not manufacture this product anywhere else in the world. Um, there was a man there whose company makes the world's smallest ultrasound machine. Um, and these are companies that are export focused, they're small, they're responsive, they work with their customers and they're growing, they're bringing on staff. So um, what we're seeing is manufacturers that um, are using Australia's innovative capabilities and inventing new things are successful and they're growing in Australia and we need to, to stand behind these guys and get excited about what they're doing. Um, but it's industries where cost is the primary driver of success, where if we're not the lowest cost producer, you know, that we're, we're striving to be the lowest cost producer, those are the industries that are really struggling and that's what we're seeing with, with automotive manufacturing. I can support Claire's illustration there, Archbishop. I recently attended a meeting uh, over breakfast that was run by the local consulate of the United States and uh, represented around the breakfast table there were uh, basically subsidiaries of US companies that operate here uh, in Victoria. And uh, one by one, these different company representatives spoke about the different things that they do here. And there was one organisation that I won't name, but suffice to say it's a, it's a division of Hewlett Packard and this particular organisation manufactures extremely sophisticated high-end uh, medical equipment for use in operating theatres. You can imagine the sort of thing we're talking about, probes and such like, that get used in those circumstances. And as the conversation went on, uh, and I, for a start, asked, well, you know, you're doing this here in Melbourne? Oh, yes, you know, in Dandenong they do this, right? Well, why would you manufacture this material here in Australia? Just to recite the usual reaction. And the chap said, uh, he said, oh yes, it's certainly more expensive than doing it overseas. That's true. He said, but nowhere else in this region can I protect my intellectual property. Mm. Mm. Uh, and he says, I'm prepared to pay, and my customers, customers are prepared to pay for, if you like, in this case, the infrastructure of legal arrangements, mm. the redress that they could have, and the protection. Not to mention, he said, the skilled people that I can deal with. 
components which are generic, I get those manufactured in China. But the really high-end stuff, I get done here. And they were doing this, you know, voluntarily. Mm. So Claire's quite right. Uh, the second point I'd make, Archbishop, in respect of that, is that people should familiarise themselves with something called additive manufacturing, uh, or 3D printing is the more common view of it. Uh, this, ladies and gentlemen, is the new dawn of manufacturing. So when I say that manufacturing in 2033 or 43 will look very different from what it does today, one of the key reasons in which we might expect that to occur is that we're eliminating the need for scale in manufacturing. Uh, the idea that essentially came to us from Henry Ford, that uh, the skill or the economics of manufacturing were driven by enormous scale, producing thousands of the same thing at once. Uh, that has now been outdated by 3D technology or additive manufacturing, where like a laser printer, you can print large numbers of customized versions, each page of a document being customized. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what's coming down the pike and therefore manufacturing is becoming a much more sophisticated exercise. It's not just about large scale and cheap inputs. So it's drifting back to the United States and it will drift back to Australia as well where design, technology, insight, skill, these things are held at a premium, which of course brings us back to the point about how you mm. resource an industry yeah. like that. Um, I, I want to do want to come back though to your your question, which is really a philosophical one, almost about change and whether the best we can do is just ameliorate um, some of the the impacts. I think it's important. So change is is hard for everyone. It, it really isn't. It's scary, and the the difficulty with change in the economy is that it, it usually hurts the people who are least able to deal with it the most, and that's that's a social issue, and we have to deal with that. But I think it's important that we see and acknowledge the incredible prosperity that's come from these types of changes mm. over time. I mean, look at this, where we are right now. Mm. Um, when you look at what's happened in Australia, real income, so, so the, the real wealth of Australians over the last 30 years has doubled. That's the, the people in Australia on average are twice as rich as they were 30 years ago. And that's, that's not that we shouldn't be embarrassed about that. That's the, the beautiful country that we live in and the incredible opportunity that all of us have here. Um, but what it also means is that we, we're going to have to work harder as the economy develops to make sure that everyone gets an equal opportunity to share in all this wealth. Um, because when you see an economy transition in the way that Australia's economy is transitioning, and what, what I'm talking about there is this growth in high-skilled jobs, mm. um, that's where the wages growth in Australia is too. Um, a, a socially just country will give all Australians the opportunity to share in that, and that means that we have to work harder to get more young people um, into the workforce, make a smooth transition from school into work, and we have to get as many young people as we can the chance to get tertiary education, because in the new world of Australia, skills are king. If you can't do something that no one else can do, um, then, then you're, you're going to end up in a casual job working in a, a, a restaurant or something like that if you want, and probably you know a job that's not going to support your family. So these are some of the issues we have mm. to deal with. But I don't think we should be afraid of this change. We should be excited about it. And we should be proud that our country is, um, is you know, putting itself out of the market on this cost stuff and going into these innovative areas. But the, the social justice issues are significant. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad for both of your more optimistic uh, forecasts about manufacturing as an importance as a sector. But I guess it, it just looking at things, it doesn't look as if we're entirely even in our application of these principles. I can understand that the, you know, if someone wants to, in another country, subsidise electricity and uh, smelt aluminium or process aluminium more cheaper than Australia, we'd be foolish not to <coughs> let them subsidise it. Or if someone wants to make cars more competitively, uh, we, uh, we can buy them cheaper. But we, we see in a whole, you know, especially in, in big areas of budget expenditure like defence procurement, uh, that we went and we have in the past, we built the Collins class submarines here because presumably we could have gone and bought them off the Swedes or the Germans and, and we're in a, a very big contract at the moment nationally about looking at submarine procurement, we're looking at uh, other military procurements and, and often they're ones that, that print in a principled way seem to come back to, uh, you know, let's get as many of those kind of jobs here. We're actually, we, we bought a hull with an engine from Spain and where um, there's the new ship Australia over at Williamstown, 
presumably we could have bought it off the Spanish where a whole lot of labour structure is much cheaper. So, I mean, whilst, whilst we're seeing some of these things work out, and I'm glad for your optimism, um, do you think there is... A, 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 it really goes to my first question. Uh, politically, can any government walk away from the opportunity of trying to pull the levers to actually uh, go against the tide, as I think they would with um, manufacturing in um, military procurement, uh, simply because the politics will um, keep us, in a way, attracted to a, if it is an older kind of manufacturing industry, that older manufacturing industry. Mm. I think it's a reprise of a common problem in economic policy, Archbishop, and, and that is that uh, it's often the case that the losers from economic change are concentrated yeah. uh, and therefore can easily mobilise politically and bring mm. pressure to bear on Claire and her colleagues in the legislature whereas those who gain from this change, notwithstanding the fact that they gain in aggregate much more, mm. uh, are much more dispersed mm. and the gains per capita are much lower than the losses per capita of the mm. small concentrated group. And so the political system naturally leans its, mm. uh, towards that. So yes, uh, that can obstruct change. And, and frankly, in our country, I mean, it obstructed change for quite some time. So in answer to your question, you, you can, can a government in particular you know, stand against these tides of economic change and, and, and resist? Well, the answer is yes, uh, you can do that. Um, but do you actually improve people's welfare by doing that? Over the longer term, the answer has to be no. And, and I think you can be quite specific about that. We ask ourselves, well, but surely it makes sense for the government to have spent so much money trying to protect jobs, for example, in the auto manufacturing business. Well, well, I mean, what, what, what was the result of that? The government ended up, and I might say governments of both political persuasions, spending large amounts of public money to produce what? Well, to keep this industry here for maybe a couple more years, and then it died anyway. Much of the money went to the shareholders, citizens of a foreign country. The jobs were not protected. People were not necessarily done a service, ladies and gentlemen. They were actually paid to stay in industries that had no future. Mm. The money should have been used to assist these folk into industries that had a future. Mm. That I might add, not that I'm defending the government's point about diesel rebates, but one difference between the mining industry and the motor vehicle industry is that the first has a future in the country and the second doesn't. Mm. So if you're going to spend public money, and I'm not suggesting you necessarily have to, but if you are, then surely you'd direct that towards an industry that has a future. And you'd help people move from one to the other. So you can resist it all right, but what happens is that you tend to raise the costs that we all face as a result of it. Um, uh, the, 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 what we're struggling with, as Claire pointed out before, the technical term for this is skill-biased technical change. It's technical change that's causing these developments, but this particular wave of technical change is skill-biased. It rewards certain skills mm. and diminishes other skills. And that's what makes, I think, the social transformation much tougher mm. than it might have been, for example, during the Industrial Revolution. Mm. I, don't, um, I don't perfectly agree with the, the tone there. <laughs> um, so you're talking about... Um, politics like that's a dirty word and um, I, I'm not sure. That's a very noble, noble thing that happens <laughs> amongst humans. <laughs> and so, we're glad that you're contributing to it. The fact that governments would, would engage with the economy and try to protect industries um, because people who work in those industries are congregated in parts of the country and will suffer when, when the support disappears. That, that is a perfectly legitimate thing to do. I don't agree that there was no point to that. I mean, this is an industry that directly employs today 45,000 Australians. There are 1,000 people that live in my electorate of Hotham that depend directly on the car industry for their employment. That's probably one person in every couple of streets in my electorate, one household that their breadwinner is associated with car manufacturing. Um, so to say that, you know, and, and that, that's just Hotham. I mean, think about Geelong. Geelong is a prime example of a city that is just being kicked to the ground by this economic transformation. And to say that the government has no role in at least um, delaying the impact of that change, I think it's just, just, uh, just completely unfair. Um, these changes um, 
Some of them, for sure, are unstoppable, um, and I think we should uh, allow them to happen to a degree. Um, but the government certainly has a role in, in um, softening the edges because economic change can be so uh, damaging to people's lives. We shouldn't forget that these are people's families that we're talking about here. And um, yeah, so so I think you know the government's definitely got a role here. Um, that this. The, the, the fast pace of the decision of um, Ford and Holden to leave Australia um, was due to government, a government decision. It was due to whether, you know, whether you're a supporter of the coalition or not, it was due to the coalition sending a clear message that it would not be providing the level of support. Um, and I don't know if that was the right thing to do. If the car industry was going to leave Australia, I think it would have been at least better for us to try to, to stretch that out over a number of years instead of saying, you know, from one particular date that in two years that industry is going to be completely gone. Yeah. That's very harsh. I, I suppose, I, I mean, I, I can see, uh, we'll turn to look in a more focused way at, at the social consequences very soon, but I can sort of see, you know, in the broad scope of economic policy, there are uh, some assumptions we make. And, and I'm not sure in the long term some of those assumptions are necessarily as uh, apparent as they are now. I mean, one is uh, certainly the future of the coal industry. At our last conversation here, we were talking about the changes to um, uh, uh, carbon reduction and uh, policies that go around that. And uh, you know, there's, there's a growing, growing issue of divestment of, of people as a principled commitment of people wanting to divest from the coal industry. Now, we, we, I think the, uh, the, the, the annual um, uh, foregone tax and, and other rebates in the mining industry is more like about $5 billion. Certainly it's about 4.8, it's a very large number. Uh, premised on the assumption that, say, coal mining has a future. Now, as much as Ben Chifley probably thought auto manufacturing had a future in the 1950s, I mean, can we, with that confidence, make that assumption into the future? Can we make, continue to make the assumption that we will have um, you know, easy, unfettered trade with Korea? I would have thought the militarisation of the, uh, the Indian Ocean and the, the, the Western Pacific makes Australia's exposure to just free access through sea lanes over the, you know, the, the horizon of the, the 30, 40 year time we're talking about, not as certain as it might be now. So I, just, I, I wonder sometimes whether, you know, if you take that longer picture, there, there could well be geopolitical and strategic reasons that you might arrive at a different conclusion to the one that we might happily arrive at today. Well, I think that's quite likely, Archbishop, and that's one of the reasons why uh, economists like to recommend to governments that you would put in policies that would keep the economy as flexible as possible. Mm. And if I may take this opportunity to sort of push the agenda, if you like, of the competition review panel, mm. uh, you know, that is part of the big picture that lies behind the government's um, request for a group of us to come and have a look at this. The more competitive the Australian economy is, the more productive it is, the more innovative it is, the more flexible it is. And that is one mechanism, not the only one, but it's a mechanism for helping us to um, prepare ourselves, as you point out, for a very uncertain future. Uh, if any number of those things were to emerge, we would very quickly have to restructure and rearrange the way the Australian economy operated. Uh, that is a whole lot easier if you've got flexible institutions and productive and skilled people. You can shift things around relatively quickly. Uh, and of course, at the same, by the same token, making us more productive and making us more competitive and innovative assists the adjustment process we're already passing through. Claire raised Geelong, can I, can I just, just to give us a sort of picture of what's happening. I and mean, what she says about the car industry and the importance of the industry for Geelong is absolutely clear. And, and I, for one, am not suggesting for a moment that there's no argument for the government to provide adjustment assistance. I mean, there is an argument for that. The question is whether you resist the change or whether you assist the change. Mm. Uh, but in the case of Geelong, for example, you know, here's a picture. So as skilled people are released from the motor vehicle industry, and let's be clear, while there are unskilled jobs, there are also some very skilled jobs yeah. in the motor vehicle industry, uh, with fitters and turners and people who've got a high level of, of manual skill. Uh, there's an organisation, one of the mining companies, that is flying uh, uh, men and women out of Geelong every week up into northwest Western Australia, where their skills, of course, are extremely highly valued. Well, they don't want to go and live in northwest Western Australia, but they're prepared to get, to get on an aircraft and do that. A lot of people do that from Cairns and 
and our parts of Queensland as well. So those skills are being redeployed. It's tough on the families, that's true, I'm not gonna deny that, but it's not as if they've got no job at all. And here's another little picture. So while the motor vehicle industry closes down in Geelong, one of our largest private hospitals is building a $300 million hospital in Geelong. Mm. Investing in the industry which is gonna grow, i.e. the health industry. So what's this? Pushing trolleys around in the hospital? Not necessarily. Can people just move from a production line in a motor vehicle manufacturing plant into a hospital? Well, no, not necessarily, that's true. But where one door is closing, another is opening. And when you think about the opportunities for younger people, for instance, that's where the opportunities are. Now, there's a transformation issue, mm. but I just want to make it you know, mm. absolutely clear that it isn't just about decline, it mm. is about growth. Uh, even in places we think of immediately in this context, cities like Geelong. Well, let, let's turn to that question because uh, it's been quite obvious to many people here in Victoria, there's been a cut of state funding in the TAFE sector, which, which was one that traditionally uh, was about helping young people gain mm -hmm. skills or people reskilling. Uh, how, how are we positioned to um, manage this transition? Um, it depends who uh, you're thinking about when, you, when you're thinking about managing the transition. So I think the people, there, there are people in Australia right now who are not prepared to embrace the new economy, uh, that, that's for sure. And they're people who don't have very high levels of skill um, and particularly uh, young people who are not doing so well at school, who are not particularly academic and don't look like they're going to go into further training and further education. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware the Brotherhood of St Lawrence has been doing some fantastic work recently around young people and unemployment. And what we are seeing is that young people who are, um, who are looking for work, there's very large numbers of young people who are looking for work, especially around these belts where there have been large amounts of manufacturing employment, so the northern suburbs of Adelaide and the northern parts of Victoria. We're seeing unemployment rates of up to 20% of young people, um, and there are very large numbers of young people who are long-term unemployed. Um, and what we need to understand with these young people is that um, young people who have experiences of unemployment early in their working life will never fully recover from it. We see that those people go on to um, have a wage differential, so they will always earn less for the rest of their life, on average, that is, um, because they've experienced long periods of unemployment, and they're much more likely to experience unemployment throughout their working life. Um, so it's young people like that that we need to be thinking about and focusing um, on. We need to help these young people kind of get onto the ladder um, so they can experience some of the prosperity that we talked about before um, instead of ending up sort of spending out their working days in a casual job that they'll never really be able to count on. And the casualisation of the, the youth uh, whole employment cohort seems to be you know, very much what in that Brotherhood of St Lawrence research, I think has been mm. found that it's very, you know, it's, it's, it's a very long period and uh, it's even being proposed, I think, from, uh, from recent uh, leaks about something Andrew Forrest is chairing, mm. that uh, young people transitioning from school are going to have a equally long period without any benefits of yeah. um, sustaining them. Yeah. being talked about six months. So, um, Ian, what, what, what's, what's the, what are the transition mm. policies that we should be really reaching for to put in place in, in a range of these issues? Yeah. Entry into the workforce is, is an issue for us uh, in this country. And <laughs> it's hard to know where to start. But let me say, make a point about casualisation first up. Um, is not, all, is not necessarily a bad thing, okay? There are a lot of young people who actually want those sorts of jobs, those mm. beginning jobs. They use them to sandwich with study and to offer young people a zero-one choice, that is to say you either have a full-time job or you don't, doesn't suit the young people. They're the ones who are wanting to sandwich it in. Uh, but is a casual job your future? No, it, clearly it isn't, right? It's a way in to the labour force. Well, well can't we create more of these sorts of jobs where people can work at odd hours at different mm. times of the day? Well, then you run smack bang into the penalty rate regime. And, and this is something, even the use of the word, for example, we talk about penalty rates, which belies the mindset which says that it is unsociable, in some way unacceptable, 
for people to work on a Saturday or a Sunday. Well, that, Archbishop, it might not suit you or me, <laughs> but that's what a lot of people want to do. They want to work on those hours and they don't regard them as unsociable. Mm. Now, it may well be appropriate to have what they call in other countries, European countries. I'm not talking about the United States that people might regard as a bit Genghis Khan on this issue. Think about Europe. They talk about premium rates. So it's not inappropriate to have different rates for mm. different times. But, but in this country, we have an industrial relations structure which is still itself struggling with the transformation of the economy and struggling with the changing patterns of work that the younger generation want to use. So when you impose what we call penalty rates on, say, restaurants on a Sunday, and you make it unprofitable for them to even open, mm. what happens is then that the young people trying to get a foothold in the market, as Claire is saying, they just don't have the opportunity. There is no job. Yeah. The place is closed, and yet outside there are people who want to buy a coffee, and over here there are young people who want to serve them, but we can't make the market work because we've deliberately intervened in the name of mm. some notion of unsociable hours. Now, again, I'm trying to be reasonable about this and say that there are you know, reasonable arguments mm. that can be put upon it, but we need to think carefully about how we intervene in the market when it is being changed by the forces we're describing. We're not doing the young people a favour mm. by demanding that they be paid time and a half, double time and a half, triple time and a half at times of the day when they want to work for the sake of their education. Um, I might just pick up on a, a really important point here about casual work. Um, one of the biggest social consequences of this decline in manufacturing is um, it, it's, it's emblematic of a change where young people a generation ago, two generations ago, who left school at the end of year 10 or maybe got through to the end of school, would have walked out of school and gotten a full-time permanent job in manufacturing um, that was of reasonable wage that they could support their family on. And um, those days are very much behind us. What we see now is that young people are going frequently into casual work, lower skilled young people are going frequently into casual work. Um, just on this point about casual work and whether people want to work casual and that sort of thing, I'm sure there are young people that would prefer to work casual hours. Um, but I would just draw your attention to a couple of facts. Um, Today, about somewhere around 25% of the workforce are employed as casual. 30% of those people work full-time hours, um, and about the same percent, I think it's 25%, have been in their role for more than a year. So for me, casual work is a very legitimate way to employ someone. I'm not opposed to casual work, but we need to make sure that if people are being employed effectively as full-time permanent employees, then they should have the rights and conditions like sick yeah. leave and annual leave yeah. that are attached that, to those that's, jobs. That's absolutely fair. Yeah. Uh, the, the other point just to make is that there have been lots of studies done about whether casual work is really a springboard into a job you can count on, and the um, results are very mixed. So for lower skill young people, a lot of them are not working part-time in a cafe and then being able to transition into you know a desk job somewhere that's permanent and where they have conditions a lot of young people are getting trapped in a cycle of casual work where they just move from job to job um, they can't borrow money they can't invest in their own education they'll never be able to buy a house um, and for me in a country like Australia that's just not fair we don't want to raise a generation of young people who don't manage to get through to finish school um, and then condemn those people to a life of uncertainty yeah, yeah I think uh the Christian tradition uh, in social policy in Australia has uh, been you know, very much driven by concepts of um, the dignity of work and, and the, the uh, if, if not the right, certainly the, good, the, the desired good uh, that, that people can have uh, fresh opportunities in every generation that, that, aren't, that, that they're not held down by some intergenerational lead in, in their saddlebag. And I think you know, there, there's some very convincing Christian arguments that have been made over the last century in Australia as to the, the kind of society we should have and, and the role of, of government and others in helping to shape that. Uh, some, but some of the evidence seems to be that the, the impact of intergenerational issues is, is certainly no less now that if you, you, know, you happen to grow up in, a, in, in an area where there's low unemployment, where there is, uh, you know, for whatever reason, 
lower expectation of school attainment or all of these things, that you know, the, the perpetuation of intergenerational disadvantage is, um, is a very challenging issue for us to break. So, uh, Claire, in your electorate, what, what people who are uh, affected by these changes in the manufacturing industry, what are they, what are they telling you about their own personal fears for themselves and, and the people, their families? I think people are worried, um, I mean, as all, all families are worried about their children and what sort of opportunities will await their children. Um, the, the point that you're making about intergenerational disadvantage is, is really important and one of the things that students of social policy and public policy are, are, are really starting to understand is that the seeds of this disadvantage are sown much earlier in life than I think we ever realised before. Um, so what we look at when we look at studies of um, students, for example, that received very high quality early childhood education just for 18 months in the, the first couple of years of their life, um, those children have significantly better life chances than students who didn't get high quality uh, early childhood education. Um, even things like parenting, the amount that children are spoken to uh, in their family home has a, a socioeconomic divide um, and that has impacts. So I think that um, governments don't want to intervene into people's homes uh, too, too much beyond, beyond uh, what people are willing to accept. But we do need to start thinking much earlier in life about how we can set expectations for young people that there's uh, real opportunities for them in the new Australian economy um, and that we're as a society here to help them try to, to, to get some of the fruits mm. of that through education. This is all about education, all about skills. Mm. But, but, but once again, the, these are market sectors uh, in, in you know, market terms that we're being told are escalating and cost too much. These things need to be pulled back. Um, I mean, the, the whole purpose of the Gonski reforms, I think, was to uh, alert the society to the importance of what you are saying and to allocate funding priorities across that. But that, that, that whole reform aspiration seems to be questioned now on... Uh, economic terms rather than social terms. Uh, this is what I'm trying to reach for. You know, what, what, are the, what are the economic policies that we should be as citizens striving to see in place because we actually, we actually want the long-term social good to be enhanced? Well, anything which Im improves the performance of the economy, Archbishop, in principle, makes it easier for governments to run um, for example, public education in a more generous way. I don't think anybody, certainly not if I speak from the conservative side of politics, thinks that investment in education is a bad idea. Mm. Um, there's often a dispute about means, which effectively is what you're referring to with the Gonski, whether that was the right set of levers and the right approach is a big debate. But I think across the political divide, people recognise the importance, as Claire has been saying, of early childhood education and of a school system which prepares people for the sort of world we're going into. Uh, there's, I'm not an education specialist, but suffice to say there are plenty who say that our education system was essentially designed for the industrial economy mm. and, and in many respects is organised like a factory. Mm. And, and the whole way in which education is handled needs to be rethought. Uh, and also refund, change the way in which it's actually you know, funded and organised. Those things take money. The more productive the economy is, the more surplus there is to do those sorts of things. So they're not inconsistent, and nor is the idea that you should be investing in the skills of the younger generation inconsistent. There's a big debate about how it should be done. Yeah, just, just on the, the, the government policy question, I think, um, as I've said, this is all about education, it's all about skills, so we need to, we should have really in Australia at least one of the best education systems in the world, if not the best. That's what we need to have if we're going to make it mm. in the new world because there are countries all over, all over the world that are experiencing exactly this situation and they are making much bigger investments in education than we are in Australia. So this is about cradle to grave from, from the very early years of life right up into the, the skills retraining that we need to invest in to get people to move from one industry to the other if that's what's going to be required. Um, I just mentioned, though, um, 
There are some issues around innovation and higher education that need to be addressed in Australia too. Um, so the idea that just um, by virtue of being Australia that we'll somehow succeed in the innovation economy is, is not true. Um, there are lots of issues that we need to be worried about. We see much lower levels of um, collaboration in Australia between universities and businesses and government than we see in other successful innovation economies. Um, we're doing some exciting things around high-tech exports, but we're not doing nearly enough of it. I mean, we're, we're not doing nearly enough of it. I can't emphasise that enough. Um, we're not very good at commercialisation in Australia. That means that sometimes we invent things, but we don't usually um, turn them into end products here in our country. Um, and we don't, uh, we don't patent as much as we see in other com um, countries. We don't um, create startups nearly as frequently as we see in, in the US and the UK. Um, so I think that... Um, government needs to think clearly mm. about how to create that sort of infrastructure that's needed to have an innovation economy and where it's, we're still a long way off on, on and, some of and these And as I things. understand it, there's still a lot of work to be done on uh, developing a, a tax structure that allows uh, some of the, the very effective um, start-up, uh, especially in the technology sector, in, where, where people, you know, in a way, are offered some equity in the company in lieu of um, start-up wages, mm -hmm. but how that's treated, uh, it, it's, yeah. it's, not, it's not treated as advantageously in Australia as in other countries. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I, you, you've heard us uh, canvass some of these issues. We've just touched a few. Good time, I think, to open up now to, um, uh, to those uh, of you amongst us who have a comment or a question, and certainly invite anyone who's got personal experience in this to be able to share some of that. Thank you very much. So as is our habit, we'll take two or three questions at a time before passing them on uh, to, the, to the panel. Hi, I'm Cinti. I'm from a, long, a family that's been in the automotive industry now for uh, over 25 years. This has been an incredibly optimistic sounding conversation, but I find it very difficult looking at my own household where we're looking at uh, no major income uh, very soon and a, an 18 year old sitting at home who's just lost his casual job and is not able to get into a job uh, full time at this stage and the fact that it seems like it's going to be quite some period of I think almost uh, depression for those coming out of the manufacturing industry whether it's in Springvale and Dandenong and Port Melbourne and Geelong um, that there will be a very you know, long-term kind of impact from how those households and families feel about their possibilities for work. I wonder how we actually really change those cultures of uh, even how we get people to, to think so that at a business level as well as at uh, individual level, people actually feel that there's the opportunity to uh, maybe make Australia a bit more able to provide work for people in those industries. What uh, the elephant in the room I, I did not hear was the global trend of the widening gap between rich and poor. Now, at, in a global level, that's extreme. But in Australia, along with the decline in manufacturing, we are, and on what you say now, that that gap between rich and poor, the haves and the have-nots, is going to expand. And it will also impact not only on young casual workers, but on women and those who are of a certain age demographic, the older people who are being told now, you must keep working. Um, what do you say about the social cost of these transitions and the genuine social cost of this widening gap between the haves and the have-nots? I have three fears in Australia. Australia has the um, capability to be one of the most unique countries in the world with anything that we do. And like the lady just mentioned, I'm afraid of middle-class erosion. I'm afraid of always comparing ourselves to the US and the UK. We're a totally different landscape. We've got 22 million people. I worked in the corporate world and they used to bring in all the ideas from America. We should be doing it like America. I really don't care about America and the UK. I just want to make sure that this country gets back on its feet. I've been in business 20 years and the last 14 months have been horrendous. We speak to companies every day. Nobody has opportunities. Everybody's shut, shutting up shop and uh, we need to keep moving. Oh, great question. So, so um, firstly, I think it's, it's really important that we acknowledge the um, 
really serious and severe impact that the shutdown of the automotive industry is going to have on 50,000 at least families around Australia. Um, this is so important and I don't want to, I mean it's important for us not to talk down manufacturing and to say that the, the manufacturing in Australia is dying but just as equally important is understanding and acknowledging the difficulty and um, the terrible circumstances that this will create, create for a lot of families. So I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't make that clear enough and um, thank you for sharing your situation with us. Um, on the, the gap between rich and poor, absolutely, this is, this is a problem. So I, I think that it, it is true um, that more, as Australia's economy develops and as we grow more prosperous, more and more wealth is amassing to, to the wealthiest people. So if we, if we divided the Australian population <coughs> into to five groups, into groups of 20%, um, the richest 20% control about 60% of household wealth in, in Australia. The poorest 20% control one. Uh, that's, that's pretty unfair. That's probably not what we want to see as a society. Um, a lot of this is, is actually, I believe, about government policy. It's about making sure that no matter what type of household you grow up in, no matter what your postcode is, you have a good chance of going to university and getting a job that will help you benefit from the fruits of Australian prosperity. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Claire. Um, Cindy, like, like Claire, I hear what you say and, and don't for a minute diminish the pain that individuals and individual families face. That's quite true. Um, one perhaps encouraging thing for you, I um, went to visit a group of auto parts manufacturers um, uh, near Christmas time last year in the height of the Productivity Commission inquiry and all of that. Uh, a chap came in and uh, was handing out these um, plastic tumblers as gifts to people who'd come along and, and I said, oh, thank you very much. And, and he said, oh, yes, he says, um, I've just been on a trade tour in Germany and these are left over. And I said, trade tour, what? I said, did you make these? And he said, oh, yes. He said, these are ours. I said, but I thought you made auto parts. And he said, oh, well, I do. He said, but it's the same basic process to take the perspex or plastic or whatever it is that he used to make Headline, headlight covers with to make tumblers for people to drink things from. And he says, oh no, he says, I'm just retooling my business now, right, to take advantage of the new opportunities and I'm traveling to Germany to sell my products. And they were very popular, I sold the whole lot, right? So there is light, there will be transformation, it'll take time for businesses to transform and they won't always be successful, but there's a little bit of light. Uh, to your question, Leone, uh, is, which of course is absolutely apposite, this is what skill-biased technical change is doing. And it's a phenomenon that is um, uh, being studied deeply by economists around the world because, correct, you're absolutely right, at a gross level it's producing an increasing dispersion of income. And the question is, how long does this last? Will that be self-correcting? No sign of that at this stage. What is the case, however, is that different countries approach the impact of that on their economies in different ways. So here in Australia, we have, as you know, a tax and social security system which overlays what the, what the market forces are doing to income distribution and resists that. The OECD regularly compares the different member countries' attempts to correct, if you like, what the market throws up by way of income distribution with the impact of tax and social security. And over the last decade or more, the Australian tax and social security system has had to work harder and harder to resist what the market's been doing. But we have been amongst, amongst the most successful at resisting that. So that there's been much, much less evidence of change net of the impact of the tax and social security system than is what has been going on gross of that. That is not true, obviously, of places like the United States, uh, where ordinary middle-class workers have stayed the same, really, for 25 years. Uh, and that dispersion has become much, much wider. The challenge is how we continue to intervene to produce what we would regard as socially acceptable outcomes, or even to improve the social outcomes that are occurring here without um, costing so much that we end up, you know, going backwards economically. Now, we're nowhere near that yet, but, th but that's the ongoing debate. So to you, I would say, yes, the issue is absolutely clear. Secondly, it is understood by 
both political parties, there are differences of view about what we can afford and how we do it, but can a government intervene to resist the impact of the market on income distribution? Absolutely. Should it do so? Yes. How much? That's a matter for us to decide politically, but we have that within our outer control. Uh, and finally, Nick, to your point, yeah, mate, the economy is running at lower than average growth at the moment because of what the exchange rate is doing, and a lot of businesses are doing it tough, that's right. The expectation is that the economy will recover over the next 24 to 36 months but as we transition out of the end of the mining investment boom. And we ought to see better times in aggregate. But behind that is the sort of transition we've been talking about. Some businesses will be doing it tough into the indefinite future, that's true. Yeah, Chris, I just thought to comment about the, the, the social change for people. I, I read in the uh, Weekend Australian a very uh, moving story, really, about a man called Guy who is affected by the BP refinery closure in Brisbane. And he just really is, you know, saying about what impact that had on him and his family. But towards the end of it, there's a, there's a quote from someone called Professor Goran Roos, mm -hmm. a leading thinker on manufacturing, predicts the average heavy manual worker who once worked in a struggling factory floor will, by 2030, be pushing beds and wheelchairs in aged care facilities. I sympathise, says Ruse, but in today's world, Guy, the person they are writing about, needs to ask himself constantly, how do I stay relevant to my future employers? It's not easy, but it's necessary. Now, I think that's probably true, because the, the service sector of the economy is growing. Uh, God willing, if we all live longer and um, uh, need care at some stage, that will generate uh, jobs for people, but I, I guess I just come back to some of my experience with men I, I knew in uh, far north Australia, who Aboriginal men who were stockmen, and when the, the whole kind of labour intensive uh, cattle industry wound up, um, they certainly didn't make uh, the kind of transitions that we op more optimistically mm -hmm. are hoping people in heavy manufacturing are making. And I think it does, uh, you know, in an in a increasingly individualistic world, um, it's a, a very difficult thing for us to culturally manage all of these different gender expectations. You know, if you're, a, if you're a, a bloke working in heavy manufacturing and you think in your lifetime you're going to have to transition to being a care worker in a nursing home, you know, do, do, does your own construct of identity, gender relations and all of those things help you manage that transition? Uh, I think these are some of the, you know, the human predicaments we're dealing with and they do come down to how we, uh, you know, how we shape ourselves as a society rather than just saying to individuals, well, you know, you're on your own journey, make the most of it. I think it, uh, I think it does actually call into question the kind of solidarity as a society we are capable of having to face this scale of challenges. My name is Kishore Dapke and I'm heartened by the optimistic picture you paint for the 30 years or so the society will be. But my question is related to the latest remarks Claire made about the importance of tertiary education, which will take us to the high skill level and therefore continue to support our manufacturing. I understand from Mr. Dali of Grattan Institute this morning that the proposal for universities is to increase the proportion of money universities get from school student fees and secondly to make it uh, necessary for them to pay back at a lower level of income and he commented it seems reasonable to me that this is going to be a great disincentive for university studies so how do we square the need for increased higher education and the disincentives which may be coming down the pipeline in this and future budgets. Claire, I would like to ask you whether you can uh, paint a picture for me of the future when you emphasize very much on further education and you say if uh, we don't have uh, people with enough education and skills, then they end up probably in a low paid job like in a restaurant, as you mentioned. Where is the balance in the future when your theory comes uh, to that we have also people with um, service uh, who are not having university education? 
Uh, my name's Graham Crapp. I come from a regional community of Albury Wodonga, a thriving community of 100,000 people. It's well serviced by three fantastic TAFE colleges, three university thriving campuses, and wonderful high schools. So education is not a challenge. But this morning, in those cities, one and a half thousand young people between the ages of 16 and 23 have no job. Mm. And they virtually have no prospect of a job in that community. My question is, and I'm, I'm enthusiastically hearing from the panel about the future, but what will you do for that, that community this morning? So, what, I mean, I think the, the, the common theme here is, is around education. Um, so we heard about um, the question about what does the future look like. Um, I mean, I think for me this is, this is all about getting people to stay in education for as long as we can. This is how we can help as many Australians as possible share in the prosperity of our country. Um, and there are government programs that have been designed to help with this and very successful government programs that have been designed to help with this. And I'm sorry to say that those are government programs that are widely sort of reported as, to me, not to be continued under the, the, current, uh, the current government. So one that I would just mention is one called Youth Connections. This was a program that, um, that found young people who were struggling to stay with school and basically supported those students in whatever they needed to keep them in school and education for as long as possible. And it had astoundingly good results for helping students stay in education for perhaps a year or two years longer than they would otherwise have had. Um, my view is that we need to invest more in those types of programs, not less, um, and we need to support these young people to stay in education for as long as we can. Mm. On the question about education funding, I couldn't agree with you more. I could not understand with all of the difficult things that Australia faces, I'm trying to charge students more to go to university. To me, this is just completely crazy. Um, for middle class and um, more well-off students who come from homes where it's absolutely expected that they go to university, um, this may not have too much impact on them. But for young people who live in my electorate of Hotham, the idea of finishing um, university as a 23-year-old or 24-year-old with a $50,000 debt will absolutely deter them from going on to further study. And these are just the students that we need to be encouraging into to, um, higher education. So I absolutely agree with you. I think it's a, it's a bad decision. Yeah, uh, sure. except that I would point out that, that when you're talking about education, I think you need to remember that the greatest social returns to education are not necessarily at the tertiary level and in particular include technical education as opposed to traditional higher education. Most of the evidence that I'm aware of suggests that uh, university education, higher education, uh, produces net private benefits for the person who engages in that over their lifetime. And, and that, uh, look, you can argue about how much, you know, or if any, the government should ask people to contribute towards the cost of that education, but let's just make this point that when it comes to higher education, those who benefit from higher education, generally speaking, appropriate many of those benefits to themselves. And therefore it's fair, apropos Leone's earlier point, that they should contribute back to the community who've paid for their education. Now that is not true of schooling, and it's probably not true of parts of technical education where, the, where we ought to be able to provide a much larger subsidy because the benefits are collective to us as a society, including some of the transitional benefits we've talked about. Um, so there I think I'm, I'm in favour of greater co-contribution from people who benefit from that. Regional communities, look it's terrific Graham that you know you paint such an encouraging picture of Albury Wodonga and there's a lot about regional Australia that gets undersold uh, in this country. But in some cases mate, I, I think it's the best advice you can give to young people you know, while they're footloose and fancy free, you know, is to get on the bus or train and go to a, another place. Um, now, I don't necessarily support what my colleagues on the Audit Commission have said, that I'd wind back their un unemployment support unless they actually move, seems a little harsh. But giving young people advice 
to find their fortune elsewhere in larger centres and then come back to Albury Wodonga later on. I, mean, I don't know. Move. What would I do? Sit down and talk to them over a cup of coffee and say, have you thought about opportunities outside Albury Wodonga? Yeah, I'm concerned about this uh, whole question of the, the hyper-urbanisation of Australia. And in fact, it's the, uh, the broad topic of our next conversation, I think, in September here. But uh, in other places, certainly I've seen it in Europe, you'll go to Switzerland, there'll be a little Swiss valley somewhere in a small village, and there'll be a high-tech manufacturing uh, plant there. For all the reasons you've heard today, when you don't need, in fact, a lot of people and the skill level is high, it, it amazes me that, that we keep concentrating uh, any place of initiative really in our big cities. And, and we are facing, and, and we're seeing it in the church, the, the almost uh, in much of rural Australia, the church is one of the last institutions left there. Uh, there's the effective depopulation of rural Australia at a rate that's unprecedented. And um, uh, the, the loss to the people in those communities of any optimism because their young people have no other choice but to leave. And so you've got increasingly high age profiles, which tends just amongst humans not to make you optimistic about your future. If you have no young people there learning the things that you know, loving the things that you love, pursuing the pastimes and pursuits that motivate you, it does make people feel hopeless. These are the social consequences of it. So I, I think there's much more thinking we've got to do in this country about whether uh, this hyper-urbanisation, just of having maybe you know, five or six enormous urban conurbations is our future, or whether you know, some of the early aspirations, and Albury Rodonga was one of them, mm. about trying to generate an inland city. I don't think we've done that as effectively as we could, but I think we've got some scope in the next 20 or 30 years to see uh, Ballarat, Bendigo, Albury Rodonga, some of our other Victorian uh, centres become of a scale. People tell me that in Geelong, when Geelong reached a certain population, you know, about a quarter of a million people, it became then much easier to recruit people to be on governance boards and other things, which actually had a, a sort of scale where you had the diversity of, of mix of population. So I, I, I think we've got to look at, you know, in a, in a, in a long term, both strategic and a, a human policy aspiration, these questions of the balance between the, the enormous urban centres and uh, other places and, uh, and find ways of, of letting some of this innovation and this new manufacturing find its home there. Well, uh, look, this is an, an enormic, enormous topic and uh, plainly it uh, affects the kind of future society we're having in Australia and I'm really grateful for the way we've engaged in it. I, I am grateful for the, the sense of optimism because I, I think it's important uh, to frame things in that way. You know, Australians, I think we've got a bit of a cultural tilt towards thinking we are the most uniquely disadvantaged people in the world. And of course, this is, this is far from true. Uh, when you uh, have any exposure to other circumstances and the aspirations of people, you know, we, we, we do need to nurture our sense of gratitude as to uh, the kind of people who are engaged in politics, as much as we might be critical of politicians and, and uh, as, they said, think that uh, politics is an, a dishonourable pursuit. We should be grateful that we have uh, a very high standard of ethics and we've got people who, uh, I, I believe, you know, across all levels of politics are probably wanting, at the heart, good outcomes for people. So we are fortunate and I think it's good to frame it that way. I think there are many, many challenges uh, and not least of those will be in, in the, the life narratives of the people who are undergoing this change. And, uh, we, we do need, as a society, to have uh, a real engagement with them to see that people aren't left behind, because I think that's one of the important principles of a, a decent and a just society. We just don't leave people behind and abandon them in, uh, in these structural changes in, in the cause of um, uh, economic readjustment. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm grateful for both of my guests this morning for the, the clarity and the honesty of their perspectives. So, uh, I'd like you to appreciate them, if you could, please. And would you join me? I'd like to uh, pray now, for, especially for people who are affected by these things, that we might be mindful of their needs. Loving God, we uh, 
are aware of so many changes that are happening in the world. The world no longer seems the, the stable kind of place that we probably all search for and we'd all like. And we particularly are aware of those people who will lose jobs, those families who will uh, have uh, vastly changed futures because of uncertainty. We pray for people in their own personal journeys that they can have the resilience and the hope to find a way through uh, the great challenges of um, losing work in manufacturing and uh, needing to reskill themselves, perhaps in areas that they would never imagine working in. And we pray for us all uh, as we are involved in our responsibilities as citizens to have views about these things that we might be well informed and uh, understand those things that, will, uh, that we can do just as ordinary people uh, to help others in these times of change. And in all those things we've discussed, those things which are uh, enormous and big, we pray for your, uh, your love to be present uh, amongst us all. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the, uh, the more quiet recess from these times over the cold months. And uh, we hope to see you and uh, others back as we engage in the development of some of these concepts in September. Thank you.